This particular series of 484 locomotives were designed as a cooperative effort by the American Locomotive Company and the Union Pacific. They've never really been accorded the uh, recognition that they should have had. Uh, they're very high capacity locomotives, high capacity both in terms of the amount of steam they can produce and the amount of work that they can produce. It's a very well-rounded design. It's a very modern design. Uh, it kind of represents the state of the art as the art existed in the late 30s and the early 40s because research work on steam locomotives virtually came to an end about then. Well, the fireman's duties are not only sitting in the chair. When I come down to work in the morning, I have to relieve the night crew. I also have to make sure that the tender is full of water, the tender is full of oil. If not, why? I've also got to get drinking water and ice since we have no refrigerator. I have to go turn on the air pump so we have air to move. I pull the chains, pull the blue flags if we're done working, make up the air hoses, make sure we got air going through what we're going out to the train with. I probably forgot something, but I usually do every morning. I forget something. I've got valves to close on the outside, and the mechanical department has a certain number of things they do also. I'm supposed to check to make sure to see that that's done. And the boss, old Steve, shows up. He'll go around and check, make sure that I checked up on them and everything is all ready to go. It's not a come down, kick the tire, climb on and go. It's quite a bit of preparation before we get on and go. Now, it does not have roller bearing rods. Uh, they tried them on two different locomotives and they were more trouble than they were worth. So when these locomotives were ordered, they did not go to roller bearing rods. They stayed with the old bronze bushing, which is inside the rod on each pin. That's grease lubricated, and it has to be lubricated. Uh, practice back in the old days and now was you'd run not more than 150 miles without renewing the grease in those bushings. Another point of a modern locomotive is mechanical lubrication. Now, I mentioned the rod bearings. Those are the only things that have to be lubricated manually. All of the axles on the locomotive are roller bearing equipped, and the only maintenance they require is to check the oil about once a month is all you have to do to them. But there are hundreds of moving parts and moving points on the locomotive. Older type locomotives either used uh, hand lubrication as the old long spout engineer's oil can, or they used a hydrostatic lubricator, which was a lubricator that used steam and oil. It mixed the steam with the oil and it used the steam pressure to, to take the oil to the various lube points. That was obsolete in the 20s. These locomotives are equipped with mechanical lubricators which are actuated off the valve gear. That thing holds two and a half gallons of oil, and you can see the many lines coming off of it, the many pipes coming off of it. The feed water heater consists of three parts. You start out with the cold water pump. That's a steam-driven turbine pump that takes water right out of the tender, right through this hose, and the water in the tender is at whatever temperature, uh, ambient temperature. Cold water pump pumps the water up into a box up in the top of the smoke box, right ahead of the exhaust stack. And there, of course, inside that stack, the temperatures vary from 12 to 1800 degrees. There's a box inside there with a cooling co with a coil in it. The cold water goes through the coil. The coil is surrounded by the exhaust steam. The exhaust steam heats the water. It heats it to almost 300 degrees, already past the boiling point. From that point, the preheated water goes to the hot water pump. The hot water pump is right here. This is a piston type pump and it takes, the, it takes the preheated water out of the smoke box and pumps it into the boiler. The reason it's a piston type pump is it has to ram that water in against the 300 pounds boiler pressure that's trying to come back out through the pipe. You turn the whole works on with a little valve in the cab that starts the steam turbine pump and it starts the water pump pumping back and forth, pumping the water in. Okay, we'll put her in gear. Keep the brakes off and go.
Most railroads back in steam days didn't trust the builders to do their own design work. Each railroad had its own engineering staff, its own huge design staff, and each railroad felt that it had to have custom-built power. And if the Union Pacific designed an extraordinary locomotive, the rest of the railroads would say, well, that's fine for the UP, but we've got to have our own. UP work was uh, very close to American Locomotive Company. The largest and most modern locomotives on the UP were built as a cooperative effort with, with ALCO. Their design staff and the railroad's design staff worked very closely together. And there were some disagreements and there were some fine arguments uh, if you read the minutes of some of the meetings. The UP developed the first high-speed 484s. Uh, we did not develop the 484 type, but we did develop it into a high-speed locomotive. The railroad was looking for passenger locomotives that could run 90 miles an hour on flat track with 26 cars. And the UP produced a design, the builder produced a design. The two designs were very far apart. There were a number of things that the UP had tried that the builder said was impossible. So there was quite a bit of give and take. And finally they said, look, it's our money. Build a locomotive the way we said. If it doesn't work, then it's our problem. They built it. It exceeded everybody's expectations, and it proved to the industry that a, a big locomotive that could pull both freight and passenger economically could be built. The locomotive has a one-piece cast steel frame. That means the entire frame, from the pilot all the way back to under the cab, was one giant sand casting, one-piece cast steel. On older locomotives, more primitive locomotives, the frame was built up of hundreds of individual pieces. The bolts would work loose, they would break over time, the frame would bend, uh, the wheels would get out of alignment and all that. That's not a problem with a cast steel underframe. It, it makes a very solid foundation. The drivers are a one-piece cast steel uh, box box casting. This is uh, much preferred to the old obsolete spoke type drivers. For one thing, it's much stronger. For another, it's easier to balance, and that's very important in a higher speed locomotive such as the 844. The rods are made of a, of a very high strength alloy. It's a, van a manganese vanadium allo alloy. You notice they're not very big. They have a very, very high section modulus with very high strength. Uh, rod failures were virtually unknown with, this lo with these locomotives. Okay, you can divide the cab of a locomotive down the middle. Everything on the right belongs to the engineer, everything on the left belongs to the fireman. Then you can further subdivide that almost horizontally. You have the valves up along the roof line. These are valves that you will either turn on or turn off when you fire the locomotive up or prepare it for service. And you don't ever fool with them again until the end of the run or you're ready to shut the locomotive down. Right now they're all on. There's a water glass on this side, a water glass on that side. That's so both of us can keep an eye on the level of the water in the boiler. And there's a valve to shut off the water glass at the top and the bottom. That's for just in case the glass should break. Of course, if it does, the cab is full of hot water and live steam, so you've got to be able to shut it off. You don't want to stay in here with the hot water and live steam, so you see an extension rod that runs right through the back wall. That glass breaks, you dive out the back door, and shut the valve off from back there. On the right side water glass, that's connected to a water column. It has three tricocks. That's to make sure the glass isn't lying to you. You have to know what the water level is. And if it gets sediment or something in it to block it up, it may be lying to you. You may think you have water and you don't. So you double check it with these tricocks. You open them up and if water comes out, you know you've got water to that height. Open the next higher one, the next higher one, until you find out where the water ends and the steam begins. When you do that, like this, you see the water come out, you know you've got water. You get down into the operating controls, everything that I'm going to have to use or everything that Lynn's going to have to use on his side that we're going to have to use regularly is here close at hand. Where we don't have to be jumping around to get a hold of it. We've got the throttle. The air brake gauges, back pressure gauge that I have to look at, the cab signals, the 
train brake, the engine brake, cylinder cock valves. The little brass handle here controls the sanders. They're off right now. You push it forward, that turns them on. The sand blows down in front of the wheels for traction. This is the bell valve, reverse gear, all the way forward, all the way to reverse. It's in neutral right now. You can see all the little notches. Those are the different adjustments in the valve gear. As the locomotive goes down the railroad, the speed increases. We'll hook it back as the speed decreases or the amount of work required increases. We'll hook it forward. This is an air-operated blowdown valve. The cab signal acknowledger, when the cab signal indication changes, the warning whistle sounds in the cab, and you acknowledge it by doing that. The only other gauges I have to concern myself with is the water pressure gauge and the speedometer. And the rest of it is looking out the window, listening to the stack, and feeling the locomotive through the seat of your pants, and figuring out what the train's doing and what you're doing and how to handle it. The only other device over here that I haven't pointed out that's very important is this, and that's the whistle. Okay, basically my job as a fireman is to make a fire, and that's where the action takes place. My side of the cab to make the fire has three controls that I generally use all the time and pretty much continuously. I've got my oil feed valve here. Oil flows from the tender down underneath the locomotive by gravity. This valve goes through the floor and controls the amount running down out of that particular pipe. I have got an atomizer here, which is nothing but steam pressure that blows the oil out into the firebox. You can hear it. The more steam I use to blow it out, I can actually blow the fire and put it out if I do it wrong. All right, but my atomizer basically helps the oil to burn. Just running in there, it would not burn. You can't get enough oil moving, and it's basically in too large a chunks. So what you do, use the steam, it breaks it up into tiny mist and burns. In combination with this and the amount of draw that the locomotive is, judging by how much throttle is on there, uh, several different factors is how you tune it. Basically, my job is to tune it as we're driving along down the road. The blower that you see right here is what we're using to create an artificial draft while we're sitting here and the throttle is not open. Main thing I'm worried about over here is water. This is my feed water pump. I have a water glass on this side. I worry more about this than the pressure. This is the boiler pressure. He's got one over there. If it falls too low, I get yelled at. If this falls too low, go below this line, the crown sheet, has been known to get hot. It will rupture. That's called a boiler explosion. Nobody survives those. We do not want that to happen. This particular feed water pump is very easy to operate. Uh, Steve showed you the turbine for the pump and the little ram engine up underneath here, and you can hear it. That's how easy it is to put water in on this one with a feed water pump. When you're going down the road, if you're working a heavier train than what we had today, you kind of figure, I've got a little notch here. You set it to where it's using the same amount of water that you're putting in. Then you can adjust this, adjust your smoke so you got a nice light gray stack, and everything will stay absolutely even, theoretically, forever. But then, of course, you got always got a hill. You've got a town that says slow down to 45. He puts in the throttle, I've got to rearrange these three. He comes out on the throttle, I've got to rearrange these three again. Uh, I have a cab signal device on my side that's a repeat of the other side, so I don't have to get up and go over and see if he's obeying the rules, because this is co-responsibility. Uh, at home, you've got to draft your fireplace. It's a big, heavy one. It's about this big by this big, and it's made of iron. That controls the amount of air going into the firebox. Uh, fire in this particular engine with that particular man over there running is kind of like driving a stick shift car. Once you get used to it, it becomes second nature because he is very good at what he does. It makes my job so much easier. If he were to get mad at me, he could really make it rough on me. But what he'll do when he toot toot, I know we're gonna go, he releases the brakes, 
he drags out the throttle over there. Well, I've got to be ready. Assuming everything else is done, you're coupled to the train, the air test is complete, and you've got a signal to leave and all that sort of thing. First thing you do is stand up and take the pin out and put it back over here so it doesn't flap around and break the glass out of the gauges. We'll show the reverse gear forward. We'll crack the throttle by pulling it back a small amount and release the engine brake. Make sure the cylinder cocks are open. The locomotive doesn't move within a reasonable amount of time, we'll give it more throttle, a little more throttle, a little more throttle until it either starts to move or the wheel slip, one or the other. Once it starts to move, we'll shut it back off and work it slowly as we, until we stretch all the slack out in the train. If you leave it open and you start jerking the cars, well, the further back, the greater impact there is in the train. Pretty soon you're knocking people on their cans back there. Starting the train is a pretty tricky process to do it right. Once you've got it moving, then you'll close the, cil you'll close the cylinder cocks, and you'll have more power that way. The only reason you have the cylinder cocks open is to blow out all the condensation. The locomotive's been setting for a long time. There will be a couple dozen gallons of water in the cylinders and superheaters and everything else. And you've got to get all of that out of there. If not, you can blow a cylinder head or a lot of other things can happen, all of them are bad. As the engine starts going and she starts talking to me, I'll start feeding her a little more oil. I've got to give it a little more atomizer because I'm breaking up more oil to burn. I'm watching my smokestack to make sure I don't have too much smoke. Now, all the water in the boiler is going to come back this way. So it will show glass will be full where the front won't be full, so I've got to keep that in mind. Also, going down hills, it all runs to the front end and it shows there's hardly any hair when you really do have some. That's something else you have to keep track of. But as our speed increases, I will continue giving you more oil, more oil for more power. The closer I am to 300 pounds, then we're up to about, oh, say, approximately 4,000 to 5,000 horsepower on a good day. Well, what you're trying to do is get the locomotive where it'll maintain the speed that you want with the minimum amount of steam and consequently the minimum amount of water and fuel being used. And you do that by making minute adjustments on the reverse gear and the throttle until you get everything like you want it. Small changes in the gradient, either up or down, or, or from, a, from, a, from one of those conditions to level or vice versa, will change everything that's going on here, and you have to change accordingly. So you'll see making different adjustments in the reverse gear. I'll shove it forward. If I want to accelerate a little bit, I'll shove it forward a few notches. When it's starting to pick up like I want it to, I'll start bringing it back a few notches. Municipal speed restrictions, like there's a 45 mile an hour speed limit through Central City. And we're sailing along at 65, and I just set the brakes enough to bring us down to 45, kick them off, and I didn't touch the throttle or the reverser, and as soon as I kick the brakes off, the engine will start to pick it back up. Uh, one of the reasons this is a rougher riding engine uh, may be because we have 450 tons going down the road, and it's checking every joint and every low spot and every little soft spot on the railroad. Seeing us from the roadside, it looks like it's a smooth ride, but it's not. You see it going down the railroad. If we're going slow enough, you can actually see the ties and the rail flexing. Now, you hit a bridge, and you can tell immediately up here. When we got on that bridge there at Columbus, everything is rock solid, nothing moved. We got off the other end, and it went like this, because the ground is softer and compressible. The bridge doesn't compress. That oil and stuff going through and dancing on my flues, it'll form a layer on there. That layer is like insulation. If you got a big train, you need maximum horsepower. So what I have to do is sand the flues. We have scoop, 
Another one. Plain old children's sand. When it's working hard, there is a real draft going in there, and I'll pour about three scoops of this in. What that'll do is it's flying down, bouncing around inside those holes and flues. It knocks all that soot loose. That's where you get that black cloud. Now, that's going to come down somewhere. But I have to do it about two or three times to get all that out of there so I can get maximum horsepower. There's always things to fool with. Of course, when the cap signals change, as they did a number of times, they have to be acknowledged. Uh, you're talking on the radio, you're thinking three or four miles down the road where you're going to have to slow down or where you're going to have to stop. Yeah. And we knew exactly where it was they wanted to go, and nobody knew how to get there except for a roundabout way. Then you're thinking, where am I going to apply the brake? How much am I going to apply? How long am I going to leave it applied? What am I going to do with the throttle in the reverse? Exactly where do I want to stop and how do I want to stop? Uh, are our trains coming? Are the dispatcher trying to call me? Where's the slack in my train? What's the speed limit here? What's the speed limit down the road? That's just part of it. Also watching the water, watching the steam pressure, watching the smoke. And before I'm doing anything drastic over here, I have to make sure that he's either watching or listening because whatever I do over here, he has to make adjustments to compensate. When he comes into a town or when he shuts the throttle off, he'll generally glance over at me. I know he's going to do something. I usually start coming back less oil into the engine because when he throws that throttle in, all of a sudden we don't have any draft and you get this big blah of black garbage up in the sky. Now, a lot of the rail fans love to see it, but the housewives with their laundry out or the Greenpeace people do not like to see that sort of thing, and it is air pollution. So we keep it down to an absolute minimum at all times. Locomotive operates on 300 pounds boiler pressure. It's rated at 63,000 pounds plus tractive effort, which is probably a conservative rating. They were tested out at five, over 5,000 cylinder horsepower, which again is a conservative rating. Uh, we know that the locomotive can outdo that. There are test reports and uh, test results that indicate it, it can perform far beyond what the uh, design engineers calculated that it could do. It has very high superheating capability. By that, it produces 750 degrees steam, which is very hot, very dry steam, which produces the most work. It has a feed water heater, which uh, preheats the water before it goes into the boiler. It uses the exhaust steam to do that, which saves a lot of uh, fuel. It has roller bearings. It has 80-inch drivers. It has uh, one-piece cast steel frame. And it has many other uh, small features that can't be seen because they're inside they're, or underneath. But it's, uh, they were very well-liked locomotives. They were very efficient locomotives. Even though they were designed for passenger service, they were very successful in freight service after passenger trains were dieselized. And they found that the maintenance costs were much less than they had anticipated. The availability was much higher than anticipated. The locomotives could pull heavier trains than it was thought that they could pull. The tonnage ratings on them were increased several times over the lives of the locomotive. And they can still pull more than their rated tonnage. Uh, it's just a good all-around locomotive. Uh, the way you get to learn all this stuff, I'm a railroader by trade, been doing it uh, since 1968, been working for the railroad, been working on the steam engine now since 19, started in 79, helped a group of employees restore the Union Pacific Challenger 3985 in Cheyenne. Uh, I'd never seen a steam engine that big run before, so I wanted to help get it running. Well, we still had old timers around here then that actually ran these things when they were new. And they knew the ropes, and those of us that showed any interest whatsoever, they took the time to explain to us and tell us and actually gave us experience down here firing it. And that's basically how I learned. Experience. Just plain old experience. Uh, I've been an engineer for 20 years, and it's just by experience and by doing. That's all. In the old days, you had to go through a series of progressive exams taken over three years. 
to be promoted from fireman to engineer. It's not quite that stringent nowadays, but there are still very specific tests that have to be have to be done. But even the test, once you pass the test, you still got to become seasoned, and the only way you become seasoned is by working all kinds of trains, all kinds of hours, all kinds of weather conditions. Uh, no two trips are the same, no two trains are the same, and it just takes, just takes years of doing.